on the program today. On our program today of the first of the Artificial Intelligence Webinar Week, we have the first presentation from Wayne Holmes, uh, Jose Bidara, and Henry Kula Simonson. And they are going to talk about artificial, artificial intelligence in teaching, our roadmap for future developments. After that presentation, you can ask them some questions via the chat, uh, and they will answer them. And then we move on to our second presentation of today, which is done by Vasilis uh, Averopoulos. Uh, his presentation is about human-computer learning interaction in a virtual laboratory. So that sounds already very interesting. And um, before moving on with um, this presentation, I would like to give the floor to George Ubax, who will do a short introduction on this webinar week. So, George. Thanks, Bo. Um, good to see some uh, friends again online here. We, uh, I just want to say the framework, uh, sketched framework under which this webinar week is uh, being launched. We have for the EV2 as our focus is on innovation and education. We've taken up the um, topic of artificial intelligence and education in the last year. Uh, I remember the first meeting in, in um, March 2019 at the WOC in uh, Barcelona. And from that point on, we had a, a call for experts within EV2 and we never had uh, such big attention for a topic like, like this one. We had 15 uh, universities and 17 representatives from within the EDTU membership uh, joining this task force. And um, uh, there was a lead from the WOC and from UNEF um, and contributions from the OUK, OUNL, uh, Uni Latuno, Fern Uni, TAM. So a combination of open universities as well as traditional universities. Um, the main focus of the of the task force was actually to find out how AI in education can help to enhance teaching and learning. What are new developments in the field of AI in education? And uh, a big focus was on institutional strategies for implementing artificial intelligence. And this has led to a um, at the end of the of the task force not only to a repository of what's there and a, a mapping of what's already there in, in Europe. The first outline, but also a project application on the uh, K2 strategic partnerships, for which we are hoping it will be selected. Um, I guess uh, we will hear about that this month or next month. Um, we did some workshops during the conferences of, of EDTU and uh, ICDE to collect also stakeholder reflections on on the topic of AI in education. And uh, and at this moment, for um, we have started this this webinar week and. I'm very much looking forward to the contributions uh, for all three days. For also tomorrow and the day after, we will start at two o'clock. And uh, indeed, for today, I, I already see some friends of mine from the task force, and I'm very much looking forward to the, the first contribution on AI and teaching a roadmap for future developments, starting with Wayne, if I'm right. Wayne, the floor is yours, please. And thank you very much, George, and yes, um, it's it, it's good to be here. Um, I've been telling my colleagues how I've been traveling more virtually than I ever did physically. So it's very exciting. Um, and it is really good to see lots of names of people that I've met through these um, amazing organizations. So good to see you all. And so as George said, um, and Bo said, um, we're looking at a project um, that I'm part of and my colleagues, um, Henrik and Jose will also be um, contributing. Um, it's an Erasmus Plus project called Artificial Intelligence and Teaching, a roadmap for future developments. And we're looking at the ways in which artificial intelligence is being used um, to complement teaching and learning in universities. Um, and <coughs> so to go to the next slide, how do I do that? Thank you. And um, so, um, this is what we're talking about today. Um, first of all, we look at what the promises and the stakeholders, and then Henrik is going to talk about the, the project itself and our objectives, etc. And then Jose is going to finish with and um, drawing this all together. So to begin with, then, um, it's really important that we all have for this um, a, a joint understanding of um, what we actually mean by AI. So can we move to the next slide, please? OK, so this is the definition that we're using. And um, so the use of computer systems designed to interact with the world through capabilities and behaviors that we think of 
as essentially human. Um, I like this because it is actually um, dealing with um, what the AI does rather than the, um, the coding or whatever's behind it. Uh, the other reason I like it is because I co-authored it. Um, but the reality is that we already know that AI is here. It's part of our daily lives in our personal agents. Um, and Adam brings all sorts of personal recommendations on Amazon and Netflix and things like that. So it's definitely here now already. And <clears throat> what we also know is that AI-powered um, learning systems are being used increasingly, uh, particularly in schools and slowly but surely in universities. And that's something that this project is focusing on. So what I wanted to do very quickly is just to take you through um, the framework that we're using to understand artificial intelligence. So firstly, we have three subdivisions, what we call learning with AI, learning about AI, and learning for AI. So these three, with, about, and for. So if we look at learning with AI, we have a student facing AI, teacher facing AI, and system facing AI. So in other words, AI that is designed that the student literally personally engages with in one way or another, or AI that the teacher engages with directly, or AI that the system, the university system engages with. So that could be things like automating timetabling or providing support through chatbots, whatever. But also we have learned about AI and lots of um, universities are doing a great deal of work on this already. So it's also about teaching young people about what it means, also teaching teachers about what it means, and also training tomorrow's AI engineers. And then finally, to explain more about what I mean by learning for AI, well, this is the reality that we are living in a world where AI is becoming increasingly dominant. And we have to understand this, and not just us, those of us involved in universities and, and, and research and training, but also the world in general. So people who walk down the street, everybody really needs to understand what these things mean so that we, the humans, um, retain um, some control. Now, <clears throat> what we would like um, to do at this point is to ask all of you um, to think about these questions. So as I said, with the project that we're doing, Henry's going to give more details, we're looking for examples. And we recognize that actually there are examples out there that we've not found. So any examples that you can give us would be much appreciated. And I believe we've got um, a question in the system that you can access to do this. So any examples of learning with AI, so using AI tools to support learning, or any examples of learning about AI, and I'm not just talking about training AI engineers in computer science departments, but more broadly than that. And finally, any examples you have of using, um, looking at how AI is impacting on the world. And here we have, fantastic, thank you so much. So this is the, um, the, the questions. If you can pop your ideas into this, um, that would be absolutely fantastic. And we'll come back to it at the end of this, this talk, but also we will be um, exploiting these ideas in our project. Okay, before handing over to Henrik, there's just one final thing I wanted to point out to you. So if we can go back to the presentation, please. Thank you, and the next, the next slide. <clears throat> Thank you very much. So one of the things that we recognize that we really have to be very careful about is to think about who are the stakeholders in this context? So of course, the students themselves are stakeholders, and it's really important that we take their needs, their wishes, their desires into account. But also the educators, the teachers, the lecturers, the professors, and of course, the researchers, so that we know what's actually happening here. But we also mustn't forget the decision makers. So when we are considering the use of AI in higher education, we need to be very careful to think about the sometimes complementary, but sometimes conflicting needs. So for example, it might be very useful for decision makers to understand um, why a particular student doesn't spend time 
um, engaging with um, a, a learning environment. But for the individual student, that might be um, engage, um, impinging on their privacy. So there's lots of different balances that we need to take into account here. So I hope that's a useful starting point to explain um, what we're doing in this project. And now Henrik will take over to talk about the project in more detail. Thank you very much, Wayne. And uh, hi, everybody. I'm very pleased to see you. Um, I'm Henrik, and I'm the coordinator of this Erasmus Plus project. I'm from a small organization called Smart Learning, Copenhagen, Denmark. And we are a 100% online uh, course provider. And uh, one of our strategic uh, focus areas at Smart Learning is uh, artificial intelligence in higher education and uh, this is one of two projects that we are working on at the moment trying to understand what uh, artificial intelligence in higher education is. Uh, the other project that I talked about or just briefly mentioned is the project about uh, AI in business intelligence or business economics. But this project is called the AIT project. It's, as I said, an Erasmus Plus project, and uh, it's based on the assumption that, it, as it says on the slide, uh, that AI, as Wayne also told us uh, uh, just a minute ago, that uh, AI is becoming ubiquitous. It's, it's everywhere, and everybody is talking about AI. And, but the potential impact of AI uh, in higher education is still very unclear to us, and that's why we've started this project. Uh, we want to learn more about the impact, and we want to find out how AI could or should be used in uh, higher education, not just as a piece of uh, a, a new piece of technology, uh, but as an integrated tool in teachers' pedagogical and didactical toolbox. So. Um, the, um, in the AIT project, we aim at uh, identifying and analysing uh, uh, all the best practices that we can find in the UK, Portugal and Denmark. So if you have any uh, examples or good ideas, we would love to have them, as um, uh, Wayne just told you, because we aim at developing a roadmap for future developments and uses of AI. Uh, my esteemed colleague, Jose, will talk about that later, so I'll leave that for now. Um, so the, in the AIT project, we, uh, as I said, aim to uncover and analyze also the national uh, characteristics, the specific technologies and some of the pedagogical approaches uh, to artificial intelligence in higher education in three countries. And uh, we are actually analyzing uh, these uh, approaches uh, in connection with AI in uh, all three countries. So an overview of the AIT project objectives are listed, uh, or uh, all the objectives are listed here in the ABCDE list on the screen. Uh, what's important to remember is that all these project objectives are based on the national characteristics of the three countries in question. The AIT project expects to be able to deliver uh, the following four outcomes. Again, Jose will be uh, talking about that later. Uh, but we are definitely planning to produce uh, some of these outcomes in the near future. And as I said before, we are in fact starting to see uh, some of these outcomes materialize already. Um, if we take a look at items one and four, uh, we are already delivering on those items and uh, we are working hard on items two and three. Uh, on the basis of the case descriptions that we are uh, building uh, or describing right now. And 
that leads me to the study of the national cases. We've chosen to use a case approach in our, uh, in our analysis, and we are an analyzing a total of nine cases. Jose will tell you more about that uh, later. Mm -hmm. But these cases are being analyzed and described and will form the backbone of the uh, national reports and the international reports, which are part of the deliveries uh, or deliverables of the project. Um, so to be able to identify these cases, we have used the theoretical framework, uh, which uh, Wayne just uh, presented uh, a few minutes ago, the with, for, and about framework. And to be able to uh, actually um, describe that in more detail, we have identified a number of subcategories. This slide shows the subcategories, and um, uh, these are just uh, examples because the field is developing as we speak. So this concludes my presentation or my part of the presentation, and I'll leave the floor to you, Jose. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you, Henrik and Wayne, for the brilliant presentations. I think I'll try to add from now on to some of the, the, the items that were shown here and some of the, the features of the project. So the nat national characteristics uh, have been focused on very specific areas, the three, especially the three strands that were shown before. And uh, we, we are expecting some outcomes that go in line with what Wayne said in the beginning. For example, uh, AI is widely taught and researched in, the, in higher education, and we, we have to know uh, what are we doing in our countries about AI and learning about AI, uh, which is probably the, the best known area of, of, um, of dissemination of AI. Um, but, um, for example, the impact of AI on human lives which is learning for AI, is not really widely taught in higher education. And this is very important because of the issues of ethics and privacy, and this is very much debated these days. Um, but also, uh, AI is not widely used to support learning in higher education. This is the tools, the devices, the systems, learning with AI. And we are concentrating on this area because this is... Uh, this is very important for us. Is if you think that um, I already, uh, artificial intelligence in higher education has been here for about 30 years, uh, only now we are thinking more seriously about this. But it's very unclear uh, where we are going and what kind of ethical issues we are going to have. So we created um, a kind of a framework based on the three, the three points. And uh, we are characterizing each case in each country, accordingly to this um, to this categorization, for example, learning with AI can be in a specific case uh, into intelligent tutoring system uh, with exploratory learning uh, environments. So this gives us a perspective and a way of, um, of classifying it and, and studying a case. Um, for example, in Portugal, uh, we, as, as Enric, I think, said before, each country will have three cases, very specific. And uh, in Portugal, we have this ABC Teach case, which is about learning analytics, fuzzy logic, and effective computer computing. Sorry, ABC means uh, effective, uh, blended, and collaborative, where there is an effective area of the project. Um, where the student is read by a camera and, and the, the system can tell if the stu student is interested or is bored or is stressed and just by the, the analysis of the, the visual data. And uh, this is a way of, of, of creating guidelines for, for a more effective studying. The learning scorecard produces a dashboard that can help students and can also help teachers or lecturers to assess the students. Uh, descriptive learning analytics is basically the, the, the paradigm here. MODEST is um, a, a very large project with the Ministry of Education, uh, which, which is analyzing the data from students, dropouts, and all kinds of issues that, that happen in our uh, educational system at uh, K-12 level and also at university level. But uh, also Denmark 
and the UK are having uh, their, their own cases. For example, I can give you a quick idea. Uh, Area 9 in, in Denmark uh, with an intelligent tutoring system, and Dampfad Analytics, uh, also with a learning analytics project, uh, AI in business economics with ex exploratory learning environment. Uh, in the UK, we have the ADA uh, student support chatbot, uh, at the Open University, uh, also learning analytics uh, project um, in, and also at the Knowledge Media Institute, the scholarly knowledge mining. As you can see, most of these projects are dealing with learning analytics. Uh, we had lots of discussions inside the project about uh, this uh, classification of learning analytics being AI or not. Uh, the fact is that it depends on the algorithms that are uh, predicting and then making decisions behind all the big data that is gathered. So one thing is to have these big data sets and the other is the, the algorithm and the kind of decisions that it is taking and in the interpretation is, is making of, of, of all this data. So uh, the project eventually will disseminate through different platforms and channels. Uh, first of all, Erasmus Plus Project Results Platform. There's a project website um, in smart learning, uh, social networking, of course, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, uh, also uh, websites of our institutions, newsletters, press releases, uh, all, and uh, as well workshops, uh, seminars like, like this one and presential ones with conferences. And uh, we are also planning some articles to be pu published in uh, AI ad journals and conferences. So basically, this is what we intend to, to do in the end. And uh, we are now very busy doing the, the literature review, the surveying and uh, analyzing our national cases. So we hope to have enough material to, to write and to publish uh, very soon. Um, I don't know. I don't have questions, a response to the questions yet. I think we are, we are going to the end of the talk and we, we have a look at those. Um, I'll just leave you with the references. Uh, these are important references that we are um, we are reflecting in this talk, but also very interesting for you to follow up uh, if you are interested in AI ad. So now I think we can answer questions and uh, I ask Bo if she can show us responses to those three questions so we can we can the three of us can answer, please. All right. Thank you very much, Wayne, Henrik, and Jose, for your presentation. It was very interesting. I will now go back to the questions. And I, I see only four people have responded so far, so I think we should give the audience a little bit more time to fill the, the answers in. Okay. <laughs> if, if anyone wants to put a question, can do it as, as well in the box, in the, if, and type it in the message box. Good idea. So uh, please take your time to read the questions once again and provide an answer to them, either in the screen or in the chat, if you want. Okay. I can say that it, it has been hard to find um, projects in education who, which are using AI uh, as a tool, as a, a tool for teaching and learning. Uh, we had some problems dealing with that. We, what we see basically is learning analytics and many, many projects uh, dealing with big data. So if any of the, the people here know about specific projects who are using AI as a tool, uh, use it for teaching and learning, we are very keen on, on uh, knowing about it. So I thank you in advance. Thank you. Thank you. I see more answers coming up. I will, um, let me see. See some people typing. Okay, I see one uh, question coming in in the chat. Maybe someone of you can answer it. Uh, why can you answer this one? <laughs> um, yeah, so <laughs> using immersive worlds with avatars is considered as using AI for teaching. Um, yeah, absolutely. That that definitely is. I mean, these these worlds have been around for a long time now, and they've had a very up and down um, um, 
set of confidence uh, around them. But for sure, if you know of particular ones that perhaps your university are using, um, we would love to hear about that. That would be very helpful. Thank you. I can see um, one more question. Yeah, so Alfredo asks, can AI be used in assessment online and face-to-face? -face? I think this is a huge question, and thank you for raising it. And it's something that I think is highly problematic. Um, if we're using, you know, things like multiple choice questions, then we don't need AI. If we're using uh, short or long form essay type answers, then the argument is that um, um, the argument is that the AI could be used to support that assessment. And in the United States, and um, they definitely use AI for determining some aspects of their SATs. Um, and in the UK, the authority with an, um, government responsibility for looking after qualifications has begun a project to investigate whether AI can be um, used to help market. And personally, I'm still very skeptical. Um, I've yet to see um, any examples um, where the AI used for assessment is genuinely um, accurate. Um, and sometimes it just picks on ridiculous things like the length of words or the complexity of words. And, and studies have shown that if you um, put a set of nonsense words together um, well, then the AI system will give you a good mark, despite the fact you're writing nonsense. All right, thank you very much. Do you see the... To Karen. Um, hi, Karen, good to hear from you. Um, um, virtual worlds are not by definition AI, but they can include aspects of AI. So it depends on the particular virtual world in question. Thank you very much. Do you see the uh, results of the questions? We can see the numbers of people who have answered. No, not the answers, no. No, that's a problem. I cannot show them because this is what I get when I share the results. So I cannot scroll any more down. Okay, well, don't worry. Maybe later on we can have those um, those examples and we can uh, discuss with online as well. Or we can use a chat for it. I can see one more uh, good question coming in. Yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a good question. It's a challenging question. Um, I, I completely agree that um, using AI to identify that mood, emotions, and values is incredibly difficult. And there are different organizations who claim to have made um, good progress. But this comes back to the ethics that they mentioned earlier. Um, you know, just because we can, theoretically at least, measure a student's emotion, the question is, should we be looking at their emotions? Is that an invasion of their privacy? So it, it's quite a challenging one, um, but you're right to raise it as an important issue. So thank you for that. Thank you very much. Very interesting questions. You can see a lot of people are typing still. Could you expand on the privacy issues? Um, well, in terms of <coughs> well, privacy and AI is 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 complex. So, to begin with, as we know, to build lots of contemporary AI machine learning models, we need lots of data. And lots of online universities have been collecting interaction data, for example. Um, 
interaction examples, um, so interaction data, um, but that's historical. And the problems with that is that the people who um, gave us that interaction data, the students from previous years, did not know, we did not tell them because we did not know that we would be using that data to create a model. So in a sense, we are, in, we are, we are doing it without their consent and we're using um, their outcomes, their interactions in order to create a model, which is a form of invasion of privacy. So it starts right there. But, but equally, as I was mentioning, in terms of um, identifying students' emotion, um, so there is a system that was developed um, in uh, another country um, where the system monitors the students throughout the time that they're in the classroom, and it will ping a, a message to the teacher if the student is not focused any further. Um, so it's it's a really uh, complex problem there. And um, you know, do we really think that's a way to go? Um, in defence, people often say, well, you know, teachers are very good at picking up on their students' emotions, and that's absolutely true. Um, the question is, is that something we wish as a society to alternate the you know, algorithms to make decisions based upon it? So I think it's, it's a very complex set of issues. We have room for one more question, and then unfortunately, we have to move on to the next webinar presentation. So, will it be possible? and when to have high, highly personalized artificial intelligence teachers in virtual reality who will also have much better social and emotional competences? Um, well, my answer to that, and I don't know the other guy just to come in, but my answer to that is possibly in the 23rd century. But for now, definitely no. And yeah. I think any AI that's developed to replace the teacher's functions is mistaken. That's that's my personal belief because I don't I think it will be um, achieving the things that you're saying in that question. But it, it's a good question. Thank you. And yeah, I think we'll always need human teachers. I agree with Wayne. There's a huge hype about this this uh, this this kind of application, but it, we are far away from something like this, and uh, it doesn't make sense at the moment to uh, get to ponder about this. Uh, let's hope uh, we can deal with the ethical issues eventually on this development. All right, thank you very much. I see a lot of things coming up in the chat. So I guess there are a lot of questions for you. Um, if possible, you can uh, give an answer to um, the people asking the questions in the chat if you want. Um, and then we, and now we will move on to the next uh, presentation, if that's okay for you. Um, so I would like to thank you all three for this wonderful presentation. It was very interesting. Thank you, Jose, Wayne, and Hendrik. Um, <laughs> thank you for being here. So feel free to answer some questions in the chat if you want. Now, uh, we would like to move on to our next presentation. Let me see if I can open this presentation. From Vasilis Saferopoulos from Hellenic Open University. Are you there? We cannot yet hear you or see you. Can you turn on your microphone or camera? Vasilis, are you there? See, you need to look out and look in again. All right. Then I will make you a presenter once you are here. Okay. Well, sorry. We just wait for Vasilis to be here and to open up his microphone and camera. I think he is there already.
Pasillas. I made you a presenter. Can you turn on your microphone and camera? I know you can do it. I just saw you a half, uh, half an hour ago. Oh, he's gone again. Yes, yes, perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here, Vazias. Thank you, too. So, uh, my presentation is about uh, human computer learning interaction in a virtual laboratory. Uh, I'm a PhD candidate at Hellenic Open University in the field of AI. So, Let's start with the learning pyramid. Uh, I guess uh, most of you are familiar with it. It uh, shows the average retention rates for each teaching method. The lecture is less than 10%, while practice doing is 75%. The virtual laboratory that we have built lies in this uh, category of practice doing. So before we go on with the, uh, the virtual laboratory, let's talk about the problems that come from on-site laboratory education. We have a usually large number of trainees and uh, there is a very short time for training. And the lab equipment is not uh, really completely available for use because it's sensitive, it's, it costs, and there is also a risk of accidents. So we have developed on labs. On labs is a virtual laboratory simulating the real biology lab of Hellenic Open University. And it has uh, some characteristics like that uh, it is 3D, it's realistic and it is interactive. The user navigates in it with the arrow keys and interacts with the various objects in a realistic way with the mouse. The specification of on labs are those of modern adventure games. And the development has been done under two uh, game engines, a uh, Unity 3D, it's a game engine released by Islet Software, a Greek game company. Uh, we used a uh, Hive 3D from 2012 to 2015. And from 2016, we have been using Unity, which is uh, one of the best uh, game engines worldwide. You can see a screenshot of on labs, the various instruments and the inventory uh, on the bottom. So the purpose of the virtual lab is to decongest the real laboratories uh, to help students become familiar uh, with the equipment in a safe way and protect the lab equipment from damages and uh, offer the students uh, the opportunity to trial and error as many times as they want. And uh, we want uh, this to be a pleasant training process and an eff effective learning process as well. Uh, we should also note that virtual lab education is to complement the on-site lab education, not to substitute it. So the experiments that we simulate in on labs uh, the first one is the use of the optical microscope. The user has to set the various, uh, uh, the various components of the microscope and then uh, create a test specimen 
and they use the microscope to uh, microscope it with all objective lenses. The other uh, procedure is the electrophoresis, a bit more complicated. We use the electric scale to scale the various powders. We use the magnetic stirrer to dissolve uh, some uh, uh, powders in liquids and then uh, we use uh, the automatic pipette to draw uh, DNA from the PCR tubes. Uh, we use the microwave to dissolve agarose powder in uh, a liquid vessel. We, use, we produce a gel uh, for the electrophoresis. We inject the DNA in it and then we use uh, the gel. We put the gel in the UV viewer to visualize the nucleic acid bands. So, OnLabs has several operation modes. The first one is the experimentation mode. The human user in this mode makes free use of all the lab equipment. Then we have the instruction mode. The computer guides the human user to complete an experiment. And then we have the evaluation mode. The computer evaluates the performance of a human user when conducting a particular experiment. And then we have a computer training mode. A human expert, uh, an expert is usually not the same person as the user, teaches the computer with machine learning either to rate properly, meaning to provide an accurate score for the user's performance, or to play properly, meaning to conduct an experiment by itself. So, uh, the rate uh, properly uh, consists of the rater training sub-mode of computer training mode and the play properly consists of bot training sub-mode. So this is the instruction mode. The student plays, the computer serving as a tutor instructs the student with voice and text and the student uh, is not allowed to do anything uh, different than the tutor suggests and the, the task finishes uh, with 100% uh, success of the student. The student is not allowed to deviate from the course that the tutor suggests. This is the evaluation mode. The student plays freely and the student is being evaluated by the computer. So the computer here serves as a rater and uh, the student is also evaluated upon the completion of, of the session. So let's talk about the scoring mechanism that we have in, uh, on labs in the evaluation mode. It consists of two parts, the success rate and the penalty points. Let's talk about the success rate. Uh, the success rate is a number ranging from 0 to 100 and it represents how close to or far from the user is from the experiment's final state. So when uh, the user makes an action, uh, like uh, connecting the microscope uh, to the socket, this is the first action that must be made, the score, the respective score, x1, becomes 1. Otherwise, it is 0. When the microscope switch is turned on, this is the second action, the respective score x2 becomes 1, otherwise it's 0. And uh, this, uh, those uh, features are discrete, they only take uh, two values on and off, so they can be interpreted in 1 and 0. But we have also continuous features like the a position of the light intensity knob. So if the light intensity is set to 18, this is the optimal uh, intensity, the score is one. And for any the other case, we get a number which is within the range of zero and one. So every action plays a role uh, in the process. Some actions are more important, more significant than the others. So we we don't want to find an average, we want to find a weighted average. So we intuitively define a particular weight for each one of them. And then we calculate the weighted average 
of the various scores and we have uh, the, success, the success rate and we multiply it by 100 so we get a percentage from 0 to 100. And uh, from the weights that we have, the different uh, weights WI, we create a weight vector and this is useful later for the machine learning we are using. Now, let's talk about the penalty points. The penalty points are assigned whenever the users perform actions in a wrong order. The success rates, the success rate does not care about the order. It's the penalty point which cares. And the aggregate score is calculated combining those two measures. So, the computer training mode consists of uh, two sub-modes. The rater training sub-mode is the first one. In this, the student plays various sessions. The human expert evaluates each session and the computer scoring mechanism is adjusted according to human experts' feedback. And the machine learning techniques used for this purpose is a genetic algorithm and an artificial neural network. So you see in this diagram, the student plays, receives a score the expert, from the expert. The expert, uh, with this score, the, this score is given as a feedback to the rater and the expert trains with machine learning the rater, the computer. This is the bot training sub-mode. The computer plays a session by itself and the human expert evaluates his session and the computer learns how to play properly. And we use reinforcement learning for this. This is uh, underdeveloped. We have developed the, the automatic uh, playing by the computer and we are now working on the implementation of reinforcement learning. And you see here in this diagram, the computer plays, the expert give a score, the score is given as feedback to the computer and the expert trains the computer with this score. So this is the genetic algorithm. The genetic algorithm is uh, on the top, you see a picture uh, depicting gene genes, chromosomes, and a population. A list uh, consists, a list is a chromosome, and it consists of various genes, and many lists together consist of a population. A genetic algorithm simulates biological evolution. Our genetic algorithm is interactive. Most genetic algorithms are not interactive, uh, so, but our is interactive. It means that a human supervisor contributes to the learning process. In our genetic algorithms, the chromosomes that uh, we have are the weight vectors. The weight vectors, let me go back for a while. The weight vectors are those here, from the, the ones that we use in the success rate. Note that those vectors here, uh, this vector in this scoring mechanism is intuitively defined by us because uh, we used our intuition and our experience and said that some actions are more important than the others, so uh, we defined an intuitive vector. But now, in the genetic algorithm, we use those, uh, uh, we use different uh, weight vectors. We want the genetic algorithm to find a better vector than the one that we have uh, intuitively defined. So, we create our first generation of 30 weight vectors, which are randomly produced. And then weight vectors like chromosomes compete against each other uh, with respect to one's fitness. The uh, fitness is expressed by a fitness function. And for each uh, uh, play session, the score produced by a weighted vector of this population and the score provided by the human expert are compared by our fitness function and according to the to their fitness some uh, of uh, the chromosomes the weight vectors are selected which means directly copied to the new generation some of them uh, 
are chosen for crossover, it means that they reproduce with each other and uh, their offspring are put into the new generation. And then after the new generation is created, a fixed percentage of the created chromosomes are mutated, exactly like uh, in uh, biology. And then uh, the genetic algorithm stops after a termination condition is satisfied, uh, but our uh, genetic algorithm termination condition is uh, 50 generations. So our genetic algorithm stops after 50 generations. So the fittest weight vector of the final generation is the training result with our genetic algorithm. Now we have the artificial neural network for the same uh, rate uh, training sub mode. Uh, the artificial neural network simulates neural network uh, in the brain. Our uh, artificial neural network consists of three layers of neurons, as you see, and to each neuron of an artificial neural network comes weights from the neurons of the previous la layer. If you look at the picture on the top, you will see some Ws on, uh, on, on the edges. We have to note here, and it's very important, that our ANN uh, has different weights and provides a different scoring mechanism from the one in the evaluation mode. So those Ws here have nothing to do with the Ws used in uh, our evaluation mode. And uh, our ANN's initial weights are randomly produced, uh, like in the genetic algorithm. And uh, for uh, each play session, our ANN produces a single value, a score, as output through its rightmost neuron. And for each play session, the human experts provides their own score to two. And the error between the ANN score and the human expert score is back propagated through the ANN and its weights are reconfigured. And uh, we train the ANN several times, epochs, as we say. So our ANN is being trained for 1000 epochs. The training result that we get from this is the ANN's final weights. So we have training and testing. The, we train on uh, set A and uh, test on set B, where set A can be uh, some, set, some training sets, set B can be some other training sets. So we test, we train on all sets and then we test on all sets. This is a biased training. Uh, but we can also train, we can do cross-validation among experts, train uh, on experts who, uh, E1, E2, E3, and test on E4, and train on all combinations like this. Uh, do cross-validation within the same expert, train on some uh, training examples of uh, expert uh, E1, and then test on the rest of the examples of E1. Train on different classifications, and train on uh, various uh, groups that we have uh, created. The classifications uh, are uh, those of the user's performance, low, medium, and high. So uh, classifi classification C1 is the classification that uh, consists of all the training sets that uh, the user performed uh, low. C2, the ones that the user performed medium, and C3, the ones that the user performed high. So, uh, we calculate the mean squared error on each testing set. And also for our genetic algorithms, we, we compare the fittest uh, weight vector to the intuitive weight vector of evaluation mode that we presented uh, before. So, those are the genetic uh, algorithm training results. Uh, we, we train, uh, we see on the top training, uh, training them on all and testing them on all, and then train them doing cross-validation among experts within uh, the same expert, 
among classification and on various group. And then on the uh, on the bottom, you see the similarity of the weight vector produced by the genetic algorithm and the original weight vector that was intuitively defined. And those are the results of the artificial neural network. And this is a graph of mean squared error to epochs of the uh, ANN uh, learning method. So you see the epochs as a, they start from zero and they finish to 1000. And we see that the mean squared error becomes lower as uh, the epochs uh, in, are increasing. So our learning methods converge. Let's talk uh, about the testing and evaluation of uh, on labs by students. We've, uh, the focus group has been a biology oriented student with minimum or zero previous knowledge in science topic. And uh, we did the pre-tests and post-tests. We asked them to fill in questionnaires in which they expressed opinion of satisfaction, motivation, engagement, etc. They practiced examinations in the real lab. And uh, we had uh, the virtual lab group, that those that were educated with on labs, and the control group, those that were educated without on labs. And they conducted a 22 steps microscopy experiment, and the results are like uh, that shown in the diagram. You see that 77% uh, of uh, students completed uh, the step easily of th those students that were educated with on labs, in contrast to 55% of the students that were educated without on labs. So future work is to simulate the rest of lab uh, instruments and biology experiments and to simulate instrument experiments at a chemistry lab, physics lab, but at any other place with instruments and procedures like uh, industrial uh, in installation. We also plan to insert more than one bots in the virtual lab and let them interact, cooperate and compete with the human user and each other, evaluate learning outcomes in terms of speed, accuracy, use of resources, etc. And what is the grand goal of on labs is to reduce the cost of laboratory education and to elevate lab education at distance to at least the same level of learning effectiveness with on-site lab education. This is our development team. This is our website that you can download on labs latest version and try. It's free. And uh, you can also uh, see our publications uh, in this site and uh, you can fill in questionnaires about the on labs usability. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Vasilis. It was a very interesting presentation, very different from the other ones, um, also about artificial intelligence. Are there any questions for Vasilis? I see him a question. Is the time factor relevant for the evaluation? No time yes. for the completion of the task. Yes, the time factor is relevant for the electrophoresis procedure and uh, in general for all procedures, uh, but it's not for the success rate, it's for the final uh, aggregate score. All right. I see three people typing. How is the relation between speech and text instruction and instruction mode regarding cognitive load? Hmm. Very nice question. Uh, well, uh, well, the the text instruction and the uh, 
and the voice instruction that you have in uh, instru in uh, instruction mode is just to help the student uh, guide through. It's uh, it's like a tutorial that most uh, commercial computer games have. When you start a commercial uh, computer game, instead of reading instructions, you get uh, some uh, wizard uh, telling you uh, what to do, what key to press, and uh, what uh, objects to use to complete uh, the things that you want. Thank you. I also see a question from Karen. Your evaluation data suggests on labs better than relapse in some ways. And Dimitri's already um, answered that question, I see. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I see Dimitri is also saying something. He's typing. Let's wait for him what he sees, what he's typing. Are there any other questions for Vasilis and his presentation? AI integrated in the instruction and learning. So it's very related, I see. So very interesting. Uh, if you may have any more questions, please feel free to send me an email. Um, I would like to stress uh, that this was the first day of the Artificial Intelligence Webinar Week. And I really want to thank all presenters who were present today and gave their interesting presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. I will give the links to the presentations and do the YouTube recording uh, later on in this chat. So, uh, but first I would like to say that tomorrow we have another presentation, just like the day thereafter. So I will move to this screen. So those were the presentations we had today. And tomorrow we will go on with uh, presentations about artificial intelligence from Jesus Boticario from UNED and from David Benares, who is a um, lecturer at the Universidad Alberta de Catalunya. And those both have very interesting and different presentations about artificial intelligence. So don't miss out and um, also come back to tomorrow. And of course, on Thursday, we have other two more uh, presentations for you ready to go. So uh, I would like to thank you all for being here present, for providing your presentation and for attending this webinar session. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you all in here. I will now give you uh, the link to our um, slideshare account where you can find presentations. You will upload them once they are um, done at the webinar session. So I would look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.